Bitcoin represents the dominant digital property network of the 21st century. It's a very simple idea. Take the money you want to give to your grandchildren, convert it to Bitcoin, put it in cold storage and wait. Let the rest of the world do the work and you'll be the beneficiary of all the intelligent people, no matter where they might be in the world, you'll be the beneficiary of all their work with doing nothing else. There's only one mistake you can make. And the mistake you can make is study the world, get anxiety about something going on somewhere in the world and sell your Bitcoin. So um, I think that the, the common phrase, you do not sell your Bitcoin is similar to what's written on the back of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is the famous two words from Douglas Adams, don't panic. <laughs>After a decent rally in recent months, the crypto market is coming off a tough weekend as macro concerns continue to spark fear in the broader market. Over the last 24 hours, the world's largest cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, traded more than 4% lower and has dropped below $40,000. The price of the world's second largest cryptocurrency, Ethereum, traded nearly 6.6% lower, and the price of Dogecoin traded nearly 10% down. Dogecoin is also dealing with the evolved situation regarding Tesla founder Elon Musk and his position at Twitter. So what's next for Bitcoin? Let's hear it from Michael Saylor. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Bitcoin bull and MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor talks about Bitcoin market outlook in 2022, panic selling and regulation of cryptocurrencies and a possible scenario of Bitcoin hitting $500,000 per coin. So without wasting any time, let's dive right into the video. You know, my outlook is very long term. And, and, and the reason I say do not sell your Bitcoin is because if I look back at my life as an investor, the things that I regret are when I found a really good idea and I underinvested in it. Like I, I, you know. Google was a good idea, Facebook was a good idea, Apple was a good idea, Amazon was a good idea. A digital monopoly that changes the world for a billion people is a good idea. And yet, the most common two mistakes after finding a good idea is, first mistake is someone says something, they talk crap about your idea, there's FUD, oh, Australia's gonna tax Google, or somebody's gonna regulate, Amazon's gonna get regulated, or something will happen, and so people panic sell. And so whenever there's anxiety in the market and you panic sell, and then you never buy back in, you regret that. And the second thing you always regret is you wish you bought more. And so a lot of people in the world, I mean, they're, they're basically being, uh, knocked around and traumatized because the media is incentivized to generate a new story every day and if it bleeds it leads and nobody wants to read a story that the risk profile hasn't statistically changed versus last year and there's no reason to read beyond this sentence so normally they always write inflammatory anxiety inducing stories and when people read them and they think about it, it gets them on the skin and they they panic and they do something irrational. When do you stop buying Bitcoin for MicroStrategy? Never. Never. <laughs> no, I, t I tell people we will be buying Bitcoin at the top forever. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to time the market. I don't intend to stop. Um, my, you could think of MicroStrategy as um, we're kind of like your, your non-existent spot ETF. Yeah. If there was a spot ETF, you'd be paying 1% fee and it would be not leveraged. With MicroStrategy, we have a software company that generates cash flow and so we convert our cash flows into Bitcoin and so we don't charge you a fee, we give you a yield, right? If you want to be 2% exposed to Bitcoin, you put 2% of your portfolio into MicroStrategy and the other 98% of your portfolio, you can invest in whatever you want. They don't want the CEO of a publicly traded company to be unpredictable and random. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine if I said, <laughs> you know, McKinsey, I think I'll buy some of this, but if I feel better about that, or if I feel the risk is different, then I'll change. 
And the problem with that is that no one else can rely upon us. And I think trust, it's a paramount theme. Trust is what built Bitcoin. Bitcoin is this universal trust network. And the people that all these people here love this is because they found something that they can depend upon and they can trust across borders, across time, across cultures. And that is such a precious thing. In the capital markets, the same thing holds. If you want to run a publicly traded company, it is very important that your shareholders trust you and your customers trust you. And trust means be predictable and do what you say you're going to do, right? And, and let other people, someone wants to hedge, they can hedge, right? I'm not going to hedge for them. I'm going to stay true to our mission. And when we decide to change our mission, we'll disclose it in an 8K, a 10K, or a 10Q, and the, and the market will react accordingly. Yeah, I, I don't think it could have been better than that. Never in 100 years did the executive branch ever endorse an asset class. When commodity index came out, the executive branch didn't say, figure out the commodities index. When John Bogle evangelized the Vanguard 500, the president didn't say every American and every agency should study the Vanguard 500 and indexing of equities, right? Um, the last time the executive branch had something to say about asset class was the gold edict back in 1933, right? So I, I feel like we've got really good support from the administration. I think the regulators are progressive and very erudite. Um, you know, when Jerome Powell, Janet Yellen, and Gary Gensler have been asked about this, they say, look, it's a, it's a store of value asset. It's speculative. If people want to speculate, they can. It's not a currency. I think that all the, um, all the regulatory agencies have some legitimate responsibility uh, to work through. I think, um, Here's the big idea, McKenzie, which is for a year, I've been in rooms with trillions and trillions of dollars. You know, and this is, it's like the Ray Dalio comment, the Jamie Dimon comment, it's something like this. It seems engineered perfectly. It's obviously better than gold. It's obviously better than all the other ideas we have. It's too perfect. It's too good to be true. And so I think someone's going to ban it. <laughs> That's the, the, and that's not uncommon. People with large sums of money that are buying fixed income or buying equity index are like, yeah, it sounds really good on paper, but you know, it must be too good to be true. Nobody's gonna let that around. And so how do you answer that criticism when someone says it's too good to be true? And it, it's, it is too good to be true. It's like perfect money. It's a, it's a perfect gold with none of the defects of gold. And it's a big tech monopoly with none of the exposure that Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon have because they have people and they do things. And that's kind of an exciting thing. And when will we stop? Well, why would we ever stop? Well, we'll just keep accreting. It should get exponentially more expensive to buy the Bitcoin, but that's okay. You know, I, when Bitcoin's 500,000 a coin, Someone's going to say, well, why are you buying that? You bought some at 10000 And the answer is going to be, because it's more scarce, desirable property than anything else that I could buy. And when will you sell it? You're not going to sell it until you've got something better to buy. But there isn't anything that I can see in this universe better to buy. So as we generate cash flows, we think that the responsible thing to do for our shareholders is we convert a currency which is devaluing into an asset which is appreciating. Bitcoin is down again as institutional investors grow nervous over the upcoming pace of tightening by the Fed. As of now, Bitcoin's cage is the $38,000 to $48,000 range and that could hold over the next week or two. Also, Bitcoin and Ether are highly correlated to the Nasdaq 100. If the NDX tanks, it will take crypto down with it. In addition to the volatile markets, Dogecoin is dealing with its own set of issues related to Musk and Twitter. Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, filings last week revealed that Musk had taken a 9.2% stake in Twitter. It was also announced that Musk, who has been critical of the social media giant over free speech issues, would join Twitter's board of directors. The news sparked a rally in Dogecoin, 
But over the weekend, Musk told Twitter he had decided not to join the board, throwing into question what kind of role Musk might play in the company's future. Many believe that Musk joining Twitter's board was not only good for the company, but also for Dogecoin, one of the three cryptocurrencies Musk owns and has been very vocal about. Also, in the current situation, it seems that macro headwinds are going to continue to impact the broader crypto market, especially with inflation so high and the Fed likely pulling liquidity out of the market. There could be more volatility in the crypto market. So when do you think Bitcoin will possibly hit $500,000 per coin? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.